the later part of last year, Russian tanks began to show up with these weird add-on structures. People have wondered what these are meant to do. The most common claim is that they're meant to stop top attack munitions, especially Javelin missiles. It seems this claim started with RT. Being Russian state-owned media, they're not exactly reliable. When you really get into it, the explanation doesn't make sense. Even if that was the true purpose, they don't seem to be working in that role. These cope cages, as they've been dubbed by some, don't seem to be extremely effective. So what are they for? That's what I aim to find out. I don't typically keep up with current day equipment, but I know someone who does. This is my friend Thinky. He's been keeping up with the current conflict more than I have, and he's pretty knowledgeable in the Russian military, so I figured out to ask him. I'll just go ahead and play the conversation now. So, start out with why the Javelin wouldn't be stopped by the cage armor. Yeah, so there are a couple of factors why the Javelin uh, wouldn't be stopped by this sort of cage armor. Uh, the first is the Javelin's warhead is frankly too large to be diffused um, by this kind of slat armor. Most slat armor, in fact, pretty much all slat armor uh, developed thus far is a fairly narrow uh, width in between the individual uh, cages. And that only can really diffuse or disable uh, any warhead that frankly, is below 100 millimeters in caliber. So when you're dealing with the Javelin, which is a 127 millimeter caliber, it's just going to hit the top of the cage armor and then detonate. And all you're effectively doing by that is you're detonating the warhead from a standoff distance, uh, which doesn't really disable or decrease the penetration of the warhead all that much. Uh, and from that, let's say hypothetically, the size of the warhead wasn't an issue in this case. The Javelin still is using a tandem warhead. So even if uh, the warhead or the uh, cage design could diffuse effectively one of the warheads, you still have the other behind it. Um, again, slat armor is not really effective in disabling or defeating tandem warhead munitions. It's only practical application currently is against older generation threats um, and we'll get into that a little bit down the road, but the Javelin is too modern of a warhead and too modern of a munition to be defeated by this kind of apparatus. Um, and, you know, the Javelin on top of that, it uses an impact fuse. So as soon as it's hitting the top of that cage, uh, you're not you're not defeating it. It's, it's going off. Um, and the, the turret armor itself of pretty much all modern Soviet uh, Soviet era or Russian era main battle tanks, and for that matter, pretty much all tanks in general, it's too thin to protect reasonably against any modern high explosive anti tank warhead. Um, but going from that, you know, in, especially in the Ukrainian theater, as we're seeing, javelins aren't the only threat to tanks or the only threat to tanks from the top. There are many different munitions and many different weapon systems that are deployed and that are being used and fielded in this theater. Uh, one of the more common weapon systems, which people tend to uh, forget about, are these older RPGs. So you have things like the PG-7 or the PG-7V, um, both being 1960s, 1970 warheads, 1970s warheads, which are not tandem warheads, and they are fairly low caliber munitions. These could potentially be defeated by this kind of cage apparatus you see on these tanks. Um, you know, th these munitions are old enough and they are small enough that that increase in standoff distance and potentially diffusing the warhead, which is how slat armor really functions and really operates, diffusing the warhead of those older munitions is potentially practical and then you might be asking well why would you be worried about rpgs from the top well you look to think places like rosny where you had operators in these small anti-tank crews um, carrying you know one or two rpgs between them would go on top of some large tall building often these were apartment complexes and firing rpgs down into these sorts of tanks in that kind of environment, in that kind of urban environment, which you're also seeing in Ukraine, that's a very real vulnerability to these tanks that might be protected by this sort of cage um, system. And, you know, 
moving from that, again, they're not the only munition that could be reasonably protected by this kind of system. You have other munitions um, like the MAMC and the MAML, both of which are fairly small uh, missile systems developed for the TB2, the TB2 unmanned aerial vehicle. Uh, the TB2, for those who don't know, is a small uh, UAV developed and produced by Turkey. Um, it's capable of carrying a wide range of ammunition, but the two most common types of guided, precision guided munitions for it are the MAMC, which is a very small, about 6.5 kilogram missile, and the MAML, which is a much larger missile um, and comes in a variety of warheads, but some of the most common uh, warheads that it uses are high explosive. And for this, both the MAMC and the MAML are what we would, I guess, consider low yield, high explosive munitions. So they do not have these large, massive high explosive charges that you see on something like um, tube artillery. So you could reasonably get an additional layer of protection by detonating these high explosive anti-personnel warheads on the top of the cage instead of it directly hitting the turret. And even if it didn't kill the tank, it could potentially disable it or cause damage to various other um, elements that are on top of the turret. So protecting against these sorts of loitering unmanned aerial vehicle munitions, which we have seen a fair few of in the last few days, uh, there is a very real benefit to doing that. And the final sort of munition that I would like to make mention to is the 82 millimeter mortar. Ukraine has quite a lot of these old Soviet era mortars. Uh, the 82 millimeter, you know, it carries a fairly good charge, high explosive charge for its size, but compared to something again, like tube artillery, so 152, 122 millimeter, it's not very significant. Um, and by detonating that sort of warhead on the top of the cage, you could provide a much greater protection to the tank and to the crew than you would have if this mortar is hitting the tank directly. So having some sort of standoff protection against these, against other high explosive loitering munitions and against older RPGs, while it may not be the most reliable or the most dependable form of protection, it's at least giving you an additional layer of protection that wouldn't otherwise be there. So those are sort of the protection aspects of this kind of cage armor. But there, it should also be mentioned that the utility of this cage you know, apparatus is not solely limited to protection. We are seeing them be used in other manners that maybe they were not originally designed or intended for. Um, and one of those methods is it gives you additional storage space. It may not look like it, but you can use that sort of cage uh, system to basically put some kit, put some gear, put your backpacks, put your sleeping packs, whatever material you have that you're carrying with the crew, put it on top of that and tie it down to the top of that cage. That gives you an additional layer of storage that you wouldn't otherwise have. And we have seen some of these cages used in this manner, used to give the crew or to give potentially a company more storage space um, for their vehicle. You know, these tanks don't have large bustle racks like you see on an Abrams. So that might be something that a real, very real and very tangible benefit for the crew and the personnel on the ground who are using these vehicles. It gives them that ability to carry more with them and not have to rely on additional vehicles to carry this, uh, supplies for them. And I guess sort of the final potential utility, and I, I should clarify, with these cages being fairly recent in how they're being deployed and used on these vehicles, any of these statements that we're making, these are not as definite as a statement you would be making about a vehicle from the Second World War. It's not as certain, it's not as concrete. So take everything that we're um, saying here that we're mentioning with some grain of salt, because it may turn out that in a couple months time, um, there's some new information that comes to light that completely invalidates what we're saying here. But for the most part, I'm trying to make reference to ways that we are seeing these vehicles used or ways that they could reasonably provide protection against. Um, and the last reasonable way I'd say we could see them being used um, well, it's for 
camouflage, for lack of a better term. We've seen some vehicles use the top of these cages to mount or to, you know, put various um, debris, trees, branches, foliage, you know, camouflage netting to help obscure or to break up the typical silhouette of these tanks. And that's something that should be mentioned. Camouflage often is not of making uh, your tank blend in completely to the background. Often it's finding some way to break up the silhouette of the tank so that people who are scanning for that specific silhouette might gloss over a silhouette that looks different. Um, and so by putting various instruments or devices or things on top of these cages, you can break up the silhouette or mask the visual signature of this tank. It should be mentioned that as far as this goes, these cages are not ideally designed for um, camouflage. They have a very large profile and they're very complicated in their construction. Um, the Russians have developed and used other sorts of visual or thermal masking implements before. Um, a common one that's referred to for modern vehicles being Nikitka, uh, which is a radar absorbent and thermal absorbent covering that sometimes tanks will put over. And to that point, I should mention, if there's any feasible or potential protection that these cages are to provide against a javelin or other guided munitions like that, what these would be doing, what these cages could be doing, if you put a camouflage or thermal netting over that cage, you could be reducing the thermal signature of the turret of these tanks so that the javelin seeker or whatever missile it is, is more enticed to hit the engine bay, for example, of the tank instead of hitting the turret. So you're basically masking the signature of where the crew and the personnel and the ammunition of the tank are. So it's more likely to just cause a, mo a mission and mobility kill of the tank instead of causing a catastrophic detonation, which would almost certainly result in the death of all crew within the vehicle. So I think that clears some things up. If you guys want to see more videos like this, let me know. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I'll see you on the next one.